Well, as I've already told you this morning, we are concluding uh, John chapter 11. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 47 through verse 57. And this is primarily, as I've already said, the reaction of the Jewish leaders to the news that Jesus had raised somebody from the dead. And um, did they welcome that knowledge with open arms? Did they say, ah, Jesus is the Messiah. We should trust him and receive him. Uh, no, they began to plot to do away with him. That is what sin does. It is basically, well, sin is of the same nature as Satan, basically. It's purely hatred against God. That's all it is. It, it is rebellion against him. And we see that at work in these men. But again, what we want to see, of course, is how the Lord even uses sin, the sins of men to bring about his glorious purposes. Well, let's read the text. Uh, John 11, beginning in verse 47. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take, it in, take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. Therefore, Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. So they were seeking for Jesus and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he will come to the feast at all, or that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so that they might seize him. So in the reading of God's word, again, may the Lord grant his blessing uh, to our understanding. We might know what this means and how we might apply it. Now, let me just begin, since we're looking at um, a uh, more negative portion of Scripture this morning, which basically caps off, as I've said, the response of the unbelievers toward Jesus. Let's remember what we did see earlier on in this chapter before we got to this point. Several uh, encouraging things that will help us do what the Lord called us to do. The first one was that Jesus loves and cares for us as his sheep. If we are his sheep, if we've trusted him, if we've received him, he loves and cares for us in the same way that he did Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Remember, Jesus was very open about his love for them. They knew he loved them. They knew that when they reached out to Jesus because Lazarus was sick, that Jesus would do something about it. And as a matter of fact, he did. Jesus loved them and he loved us enough to lay down his life for us. We need to remember that. Secondly, we did see, on the other hand, not, not really so much on the other hand, but we did see that his love for us and his care for us doesn't mean that we're not going to have to face difficulties in life. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have to face death. Jesus loved Lazarus, but Lazarus was sick, and Lazarus died, but he was also raised again to life. But remember, here's one of those few exceptions to that principle in Scripture. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then comes the judgment. Lazarus had to die twice. But you see, he was willing to do that because of his love for the Lord Jesus Christ and because of Jesus' love for him. Not only that, but we're going to see, I believe it's in the next chapter, that Lazarus himself becomes a marked man. 
now that he's been raised from the dead, he's a testimony of, of the power of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his glory. And so now the Jews want to kill him. He becomes a marked man. He was in danger. Well, the Lord told us that in this life we will have tribulation. So being loved by the Lord doesn't mean we're not going to have to face difficulties. It doesn't mean that we're not going to sometimes have to face death. And eventually all of us are going to die. And I should just mention along those lines, we also saw the fact that we are going to die and the fact that time is limited to us, each one of us, should cause us to use the time that the Lord has given to us, the remaining time, well. To love and to serve Him while we're in this world. Because remember, we're not here for very long. Our lives are just like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Now, all of this remembering what the main part of the passage was that we saw last week, and that is that when we finally die, because of his love for us, we're not really going to die, but we're going to go to be with Jesus, which Paul tells us is very much better than living in this world, even living here and serving the Lord. We're also reminded that when we die and our bodies are put into the ground, that they're not going to stay there. Jesus is going to come again to raise the dead. And then anything that we might have had to suffer in this world for his glory will be rewarded. The Lord is going to more than compensate us for any inconvenience that we had to endure for his name and his glory with a reward that we actually get to keep forever. Now those, those are encouraging things and those are meant to get us, of course, to let go of our lives in this world, not worry, as Jesus said, don't fear man. We're not to fear those who can just kill the body but can't you know, kill the soul, can't do anything to that. But we should fear the Lord and we should do his work. We should love him and serve him. He's given us so many motives. Now, the fact that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead is the evidence, it is the proof that all these things are true. They are real. They're not just a fantasy. We have eyewitness accounts and we have the Spirit of God within us telling us that these things actually did take place. Now, the last thing we saw was that there were many who saw this miracle. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead after he had been in the tomb for four days. They saw that Jesus had this power and they believed and they were saved. But we also saw that there were many who saw it who didn't believe. Now this morning, John focuses on this last group. Instead of recognizing this as indisputable proof that Jesus is in fact who he said that he is, he is the Messiah, and responding as they should have responded in faith and repentance. They should have trusted him. Instead, they went and reported what Jesus did to his enemies, to the Pharisees. Now, we see here that when the Pharisees heard it, instead of responding as they should have, turning from their sins and trusting in the Lord Jesus and receiving him as their Messiah, they saw him as a threat, a threat to their power, a threat to their position, and they began to plot to do away with him. But, of course, we also see in the middle of this council how the Lord provides a testimony of how he was intending to use their plot, their plan to kill him, because they actually do carry that plan out, they actually do kill him, how he was intending on using that evil action to bring about the salvation of the world. And he does it from the mouth, basically puts these words in the mouth of the very one who brings up the suggestion to kill Jesus. He uses, again, evil for good purposes. So this morning, let's look at a couple of things. First of all, let's consider what sin is, how it works in the lives of those whose, basically, whose hearts are dominated by it. But let's consider also that the Lord is able to use even the evil that is in this world, even in the sins that are in the hearts of unconverted people, even the sin in our own hearts, to bring about His good purposes. So first of all, we see, I think, an excellent example of how sin works in the hearts of those whose lives are dominated by it. Sin is what motivated the Pharisees, or actually the ones who brought this news about Lazarus to the Pharisees. They wanted to tell Jesus' enemies what Jesus had done. 
And basically, I think, wanted this kind of response from them to see what they would do to do away with him. And sin is also what motivated these Pharisees to do what they did next in their plot to do with Jesus. Now again, when the Jews who saw the miracle arrived and reported what Jesus had done to the Pharisees, they immediately called together a council. A council not to, to basically say, how are we going to respond to this? Is Jesus the Messiah or not? If he is, we should receive him. But rather to figure out how can we get rid of this guy? How can we get rid of this troublemaker? Because if Jesus kept doing the things that he was doing, it wouldn't be long before all the Jews believed in him. And when the Romans finally came in to put a stop to this, which they would, because remember the Jews were expecting Jesus to be a political leader against Rome. Rome was going to come in and deal with it at some point, right? They would eventually come in and have to deal with it. And when they did, the Jewish leaders would lose their position. They would lose their power. The nation might, as a matter of fact, even come to an end. Well, Caiaphas, the high priest, quickly saw there was only one solution to the problem. Jesus is the problem. We need to do away with him. Now, this is something that their hearts were already set on from the time that Jesus healed the blind man and the time, I think, he, well, he healed the, the lame man. They wanted to kill him because he healed on the Sabbath. So they were already wanting to do this, but now we see a, a, an intensification of that. We see them now plotting to do away with Jesus. Caiaphas basically says this in verses 49 and 15. Oh, excuse me, 49 and 50. You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Basically, better that Jesus die rather than the whole nation perish. And so we read in verse 53, so from that day on, they planned together to kill him. Now again, we ask ourselves the question, what kind of effect should the raising of Lazarus had on these individuals. How should they have responded when they saw that miracle and all the other things that Jesus did? Now John in his gospel is being very selective. He's only telling us about a handful of miracles, but he does every once in a while remind us that there were many other things that Jesus did. How should they respond to these things? Well, in the way that they should have, which is realize only the Messiah could do these things. Jesus was doing them. He must be the Messiah. They should have acknowledged that. They should have received him, but they didn't. And the question is, why didn't they? Well, we might wonder the same thing. When we share the gospel with people, with other people, and some of those people, perhaps most of those people, don't receive him. When they respond to us as though we're crazy, some kind of religious fanatic, um, why do you believe these kinds of things? Especially against the clear evidence of science, which has basically proven that God never existed, God is dead, and that evolution is the way we came into being. I mean, why are there people like Richard Dawkins uh, who have devoted their lives to do away with or to set people free from what they consider to be a delusion? Remember Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. How can there be people like that, especially when we, everywhere we look, we see evidence for God's existence? I mean, we, we see it and we acknowledge it. We understand that what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20 is true. He says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. By the way, Dawkins sees it. So does everybody else who's fighting against Christianity. Not only do they see it, but Paul says, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Does anyone have any excuse for not believing that God exists? Not according to Scripture. And as we look at nature, as we look at everything God has made, as we look at the wonder of his design on, on a microscopic scale in the cell or in the atom, or if we look at it in the creatures he's made or in this world and all of its, uh, the way it works together so that everything exists, survives and takes care of itself, or we look at it on a cosmic level, 
and we see the design in the universe. Everything that we see points to the designer of infinite power and wisdom. And of course, as we look at ourselves and everything that's true about us, we know this one who made us has these attributes. He also happens to be good. I mean, look at all the good things we enjoy. And he's angry. We also see evidences of his anger against sin in our conscience and through the various things we see taking place in the world. So how can these look at all these things we look at and we say, God exists, and they look at it and say, they say, God can't exist. This is just some great cosmic accident. What's the difference between the two of us? Well, the difference is sin. They're under the control of sin. Sin has control of their hearts. Sin has control of their minds. Their hearts dictate to them that they will not believe in God. They will not have this God, and so they use their minds to try to tear down the knowledge of God. You know, sin is used in Scripture in, in at least two different senses. First of all, it's used to refer to the breaking of God's commandments. When you break God's commandments, you sin. John tells us in 1 John 3, 4 that sin is lawlessness. When we break God's law, we sin. When we sin, we become guilty. And of course, if that guilt isn't removed, that guilt must be punished. That's the reason why there is hell. Now, in light of that, the good news is, of course, that God has provided a way to be cleansed of that guilt, to have it wiped out. He has provided a Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord, who came into this world to take away our sins if we will only receive Him and only trust Him. It's a free gift. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to work for it. He offers to us freely. If we will only receive Him, only trust Him, He will forgive us not just part of our sins, but all of our sins. Everything that we have done. And because the Lord will also keep us, as we've already seen in John chapter 10, he's, Jesus says, I give my sheep eternal life and they will never perish. What it means is he will keep us going the right direction and he will keep cleansing us of all of our sins. Jesus is the remedy that God has provided for sin, for sin in the sense of guilt. And praise God that he has. That's the reason why we have such a hope and a future. But sin in Scripture can also refer to the desire that is in our hearts to disobey God. In other words, it's the cause of our sinful actions, the cause of our breaking God's laws. Scripture, when it refers to sin in that sense, calls it flesh, the flesh. And, as I've already mentioned, flesh is basically hatred against God, hatred against that which makes God truly lovely to us, and that is His holiness. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 6 through 8, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Remember what Jesus said to the Jews after he had fed them, you know, the, the 5,000 in the wilderness and they were following after him and so forth. He says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Jesus wasn't talking about the flesh and bones and our bodies. He was talking about that sinful desire in our hearts. It doesn't profit anything. The reason why it doesn't is because it is bending our mind against God, our heart is bent against God, we are hostile against God. That's the reason why these men did the things they did. That's the reason why we have Dawkins and others like it. The flesh is basically this flesh, this principle, this desire, sinful, this hatred, is basically in the heart of every single person who is born into this world. It was in our hearts before we came to Jesus Christ. By the way, that's the reason why we have to train our children to do what's right and not what's wrong. They automatically do what's wrong. We need to train them to do what's right because of this principle. We all know it. We've all experienced it. As a matter of fact, even as Christians, we still have some of it in our hearts, which is why we often struggle to obey the Lord the way we would like to obey Him. But for those who haven't come to Him, it is there dominating their hearts, exerting it's full power, except, of course, for what the Lord holds back by His Holy Spirit. Thankfully, He restrains sin in the world. 
So again, we ask the question, is it any wonder that there are people like Dawkins? Is it any wonder that, that some that we share the gospel with are going to resent that and they're going to reject it? Should it really surprise us the Pharisees responded the way that they did to the fact that Jesus had raised the man from the dead? They were, they're simply making choices consistent with what it is they really desire in their hearts, which is anything but God. So sin is the problem, sin, that evil desire, which is why God sent his son into the world. He sent him into the world not only to make an atonement for sin on the cross, which will completely clear the slate. He's not only sent him into the world to obey the law of God perfectly so that if you trust him, not only will your sins be forgiven, but you'll be given a perfect righteousness, a perfect record of obedience. But he also sent him into the world so that Jesus might bring back that which was lost when Adam and Eve sinned and fell many years ago, which was the Holy Spirit to break the power of sin in our hearts. If you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, not only will he forgive you all the sins that you've committed against him, but he will free you from this power sin has over your heart so that you can obey him. Remember we just saw before that those who are in the flesh cannot submit to the law of God. The Spirit of God can break that power and give you the ability to obey him which is what the beauty, that's the beauty of the gospel. Through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has overcome the guilt of sin and the power of sin. So what we see going on in these Pharisees, you need to realize, I need to realize, we all need to realize this is what we would be doing apart from the grace of God. But the Lord broke that power of sin in our hearts and set us free. And if you're still under the power of sin, the only one who can set you free is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way. Now before we get to the second point, again, how the Lord uses sin for good purposes, let me just make a quick note here that about this council and their decision regarding Jesus Christ because this does mark a turning point in our Lord's ministry. We read in verse 54, therefore Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Uh, basically, Jesus was no longer going to minister publicly in Jerusalem from that point until he came again to the Passover. Doesn't mean he wasn't going to have any public ministry, but not in Jerusalem because of the plot of the leaders who were central or centralized in Jerusalem to do away with him. Now, this wasn't going to be for very long, though, because in chapter 10, we read about the Feast of Dedication, which was the rededication of the temple after, um, you know, the, the struggle there, the Feast of Purim and so forth. Um, there was only four months between that feast and the Feast of Passover, and we've already moved some distance towards it. John now tells us in verse 55 that that Passover at which our Lord would lay down his life was now near. Some of the Jews had come to the feast. We see at the end of the chapter they were already looking for Jesus, wondering whether Jesus was going to come to the feast at all in light of the fact that the leaders wanted to kill him. The chief priests and Pharisees had given orders if anyone saw him, they were re to report it immediately so that they could come and arrest him. Again, they wanted to kill him before, but now their hearts were bent on it. They were wondering, is Jesus going to come up to the feast? Well, of course he is, because the Passover is one of the three required feasts, and Jesus had to obey, and he did so willingly because he loved his Father. He did everything that was pleasing to his Father, but it was at this particular feast that he was going to lay down his life, fulfilling the picture of the Passover, right? The Passover was instituted when the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt he gave them the picture of the Passover lamb that was sacrificed in their place. Jesus is the Passover lamb. And this is where he was going to finally lay down his life for the sins of the world. John the Baptist said earlier in John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now this brings us to the second and uh, basically the final point, and that is how the Lord is able to use 
even sin, to bring about His good purposes. Now, I just want to back up for a moment and again consider what Caiaphas said at the council in verses 49 and 50. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now, why did Caiaphas say that? Well, he said it because he believed that if he and the Jews were going to hold on to what they had, Jesus had to go. That's why Caiaphas said this, at least from his perspective. But I want you to notice that even though that is what Caiaphas thought, that's what Caiaphas wanted, and that's why he said what he said, God actually intended something else through Caiaphas's evil speech and action. John writes in verses 51 through 52. Now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Now, Caiaphas may have thought he was saying this purely on his own, but obviously he wasn't. God was actually speaking through him. I think this is a great example of how prophecy works. You know, the prophets oftentimes when they were prophesying by the Spirit of God, they didn't fully understand what it was they were saying. Clearly, Caiaphas didn't. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. The prophets prophesied. They knew they were prophesying about the Christ, but there were things they didn't know. And it really wasn't clear until Jesus came and did what he did. And then Peter, of course, and the apostles write to explain what it is that Jesus has done. The prophets didn't always under, didn't understand. They didn't comprehend what the Lord meant. And Caiaphas clearly did not understand the implications of what he was saying. But here also is a great example of how the Lord can and does bring good out of evil. Caiaphas meant this to be a rallying call against Jesus to kill him. But God meant it to reveal what he was planning on doing to save mankind. Jesus would die. But not as a martyr for the sake of these Pharisees to hold on to their position and power, but as an offering to take away the guilt of sin and to break the power of sin as we've already seen. Now really what we see here is the answer to the question, why does God allow evil to exist? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I mean, God is omnipotent. God could do away with evil if he wanted to, but, but he doesn't. He allows it to exist. He knew it would come into the world that he created and he had planned to use it for a reason, but what is that reason? Well, the reason is that he might use it for his glory, that he might bring good out of it. Why did God allow Joseph's brothers to turn against Joseph and sell him as a slave into Egypt? It was that the Lord might raise him out of that prison he eventually ends up in and elevate him to second to Pharaoh in order that he might save his people. Why did he allow his son to be put to death at the hands of wicked men? It was that he might save the world. Why did he allow Caiaphas to desire what he desired and then to speak what he spoke to incense the leaders of Israel against Jesus? It was that they might do that in order that Jesus would be put to death. And he also basically had Caiaphas say this so that they would know as a witness and a testimony to them what God was intending to do. Jesus had to die. Now, he didn't force any of these people. We need to remember that. He didn't force any of these to do this. He's simply using the evil that was already in their hearts. They already wanted to kill Jesus, you see. He's just simply using that for good purposes. We say, well, the death of Christ, that doesn't seem like a very good thing. 
It was a crime. They committed the greatest crime in history. They took an innocent man who was God in human flesh and they nailed him to a cross as a common criminal for crimes he didn't commit. And yet, in that action, they also brought about what God intended, the salvation of all of his people through that shed blood of Christ. So God is using their evil for good purposes. God is revealing through Caiaphas what he's intending on doing. That Jesus would die for the nation, he would die for the Jews, but not only the Jews, also for the whole world. Verse 52, so that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Remember what Jesus said earlier in John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Nobody took Jesus' life away from him. These wicked men could not have killed Jesus unless Jesus willingly gave his life. He's the good shepherd who willingly lays down his life for his sheep because, excuse me, of his love for them. And then he says in verse 16 of John chapter 10, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Jesus is basically saying in these two verses exactly the same thing. It's coming out of the mouth of Caiaphas and the way that John is interpreting it. Jesus was going to die, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. They are the other sheep who are not of this fold that must also be gathered into one flock, one flock with one shepherd. Jesus died for the Jews. He is their Messiah. He is the one God promised them, but he also died for the Gentiles. For those, Paul tells us, who were far off, who were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of God, in order to bring them near and to break down the wall that separated them and to make them into one new man. That means that Jesus died for us if we are trusting him this morning so that we might receive forgiveness of sins, that he might break the power of sin in our hearts, that we might receive the blessings of eternal life. Now, of course, in our response to this, we should be thankful that God uses evil for, for good purposes because God basically comes to the world after the fall of Adam and Eve and all there is is evil. But he chooses not to destroy the world, but he chooses, as he had in, eternally planned to do, to bring his son into the world to save a people a people that included not only the children, physical children of Abraham, but also those who would believe like Abraham, those who would trust in his son. We need to be thankful God intended to use evil for, for good purposes. We need to be thankful that God sent his son into the world, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. We need to be thankful that he has provided for us a sacrifice for our sins and a way to be free from it, to have that bondage to sin which we were under when we came into this world broken so that we could obey him. We need to be thankful that though we were once not a people, now we are the people of God. Now we are the children of God. So let me just remind you in closing this morning, not only to be thankful, but if you happen to be one of those who haven't received the Lord Jesus Christ, let this be a reminder to you that he is the only way. You, you can be right with God. You can have a you know, reestablished relationship with God, but only through the Lord Jesus Christ. There are not many paths to God. There is only one, and this is it. If you do not trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that sin, that flesh, that desire that's in your heart is going to continually lead you away from him and the sins that you commit while running away from him are only going to increase your guilt and of course if you die in this condition the Bible says you will go down into hell forever but the Bible says there is good news and the good news is if you will only look to Jesus in faith believe that he is a savior that God has provided for the world actually put your trust in this Savior. That is what it means by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, not just believing the facts. I believe what the Bible says. Well, demons believe that too. 
The devil believes that. They tremble. But it's only those who trust Jesus, who love Him, who cast their whole hope of heaven upon Him, who fall to their knees in submission to Him and say, Lord, no longer what I want, but what You want. Those are the ones, and basically that's the evidence that you have trusted Jesus Christ. That, those are the ones who are received by the Lord, who are brought into His family, who have the power of sin broken in their lives. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. And then finally, let's remember, there's a lot of people out there who need to hear the gospel. We need to remember that Jesus came into the world to save not only Jews, but also Gentiles. We need to remember that Jesus has authorized us as his ambassadors to take this gospel and to offer it to everyone. We are to take the seed of his word and we are to broadcast it as far as we possibly can. The more, the better. You know, this isn't one where we want to make sure we get the, the seed just in the good soil because we can't see the condition of the soil. We need to broadcast it in all the ground that is presented before us. The more, the better. And we should never allow ourselves basically to think that a person is beyond his reach. Sometimes I think we look at people and we say, you know what, they're not going to receive Christ. So I'm just not going to tell them. There's no hope this person's going to receive Christ. They're so hard. They've been beaten down so much by the world. They're so bitter. There's no way they're ever going to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, so I'm not going to tell them. Well, you'd be surprised what the Lord can do through his gospel. He can break the hardest of hearts, can't he? We need to share that gospel with them. And just, just one more note on that lines is we can argue with people all the time, and, and oftentimes we find ourselves doing that, and some of those arguments might actually be helpful and some of them may not be, but make sure that you always present the gospel because the gospel is what saves, not the arguments, not the apologetics, um, not arguments about the er, you know, early earth, late earth, evolution, and so forth. Sometimes we do have to deal with those things, but they're not going to be saved if you happen to convince them that creationism is true. You need to share the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. It's what the Spirit of God uses to change hearts. That's what's going to break through the stony heart, not the argumentation. So make sure that it's the seed you're broadcasting, the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. Share Jesus with others. Bring the gospel to them, to as many as you can, and see what the Lord might do. Well, you know, the, um, the thing is, the... The Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life in order to, as we saw this morning, through the, through the mouth of one of his enemies, not only to gather together the people of Israel, but also to gather together uh, those who were scattered abroad. And uh, that's not referring, I think, to the dispersion of the Jews, but I think it's referring to the Gentiles. We know that that's the case. We know that's true. That's the reason why Jesus died, to gather his people together so that his sheep might be gathered into one fold with one shepherd. Jesus gave his life in order that we might be saved and in order that others might be saved. And that's what the table reminds us of. It seems to me that as we come to the table, you know, on, on each occasion that we have the opportunity to do this, and for us it happens to be every Lord's Day, it gives us the opportunity to renew our commitment and our covenant with the Lord. Basically, he's given us the commission as a church to take this gospel out and to share it with others. When people receive the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring them in and to love them and encourage them and to, to build them up, uh, to equip them so that they too can go into the field and begin to do the work of bringing others to him as well. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice so that we would be able to do this, so that we could be brought into the fold and we could be entrusted with this work and we could labor for him. And that's what the table reminds us of, but it also reminds us each Lord's Day of our commitment to do what he's called us to do. We need to renew our covenant with him, our commitment to do this work. So I'm going to suggest that uh, as we prepare to come to the Lord's table now, that we remember what our Lord Jesus wants us to remember. 
which is, of course, his, his death. But remember, too, Jesus didn't remain dead. He overcame death. If he hadn't overcome death, we would have no expectation that we would overcome death. But when he was raised from the dead, that was his father's declaration that Jesus is who he said he was, and he had accomplished what he had accomplished. Our sin put him in the grave. That's why he was put to death. But the fact that he took our sins away and they were all forgiven was why death could no longer hold him. So let's think about that as we come to the table. Let's renew our covenant with the Lord. Our, if we've trusted him and given ourselves to him, let's renew our commitment to serve him. And let's uh, also deal with our sins. You know, we don't want to come to the Lord's table while cherishing, nurturing any sin. We want to make sure that we repent of it all. So let's spend just a few moments in silent prayer.